so hello everybody. Welcome at on Slevarna stage. Our program is uh, continue and it's already 4 p.m. So, but still a lot of good talks is uh, ahead of us. Uh, before I will introduce the next speaker, I would just like to point out one thing because I realized it when I was reading the bio. Uh, I was in the discussion with one uh, developer like a few weeks ago and we discussed how important it is for the people to understand the audience we are developing for or you are developing for. And uh, we talked this as be very crucial. So this is also the thing why this year we try to put much more diverse talks into the program, like people from sociological background or just theoreticians, not many into like so much into crypto technology. So we would like to, we are very open for your feedback to let us know what you think about this approach for the next year of ACCP, which are coming. But now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome on stage Mark Nadal, who is a mathematician who turned programmer he runs a VC-backed open source company and has traveled to 30 countries. The diverse cultures, he has experienced for his passion for learning, sharing, and creating open technology freely for all. So, Mark, thank you for coming, and the floor is yours. Thanks for having me. I'm Mark Nadal, and I'm really excited to present the research that my research team has spent the whole last year on exploring different economic models. So we're partly moving towards looking at economics because our current decentralized network has about 8 million monthly active users on it. We're going to be working with some nonprofits and startups over the next year to two years that already have a large audience of their own that will be bringing up that number to 80 million monthly active users in the next year to two years. At that point, we realize this is 1% of the world's population. We need to stop worrying about us sitting in a basement writing code and look more at who are these people? What is the psychology behind people? What is the economics that drive things forward? So the first thing I want to note that will be the theme for this entire presentation is if money is a tool that enables the lifestyle that we want, then economics is a tool to get the society that we want. And that means we need to study economics. And there are a lot of problems to solve in economics. I'm going to be presenting the six foundational flaws or questions or problems that any economic system must address. So that way we can figure out how to cultivate a better society based off of these problems that hopefully moves people's alignments towards each other forward. So without further ado, problem number six, it might be a little bit surprising. How do you measure digital goods or any post-scarce item? We live in an economic model based off of scarcity. It's a zero-sum game, both capitalism and socialism. That, and Bitcoin is as well. If I give you Bitcoin, I lose the Bitcoin. You gain the Bitcoin, I lose the Bitcoin. A zero-sum, scarce game. So most of these systems cannot account for digital goods. But there's a very simple equation for that. Supply over demand equals A. A is the abundance factor of something. So if we have five Lamborghinis and 100 people in a population, the five over 100 winds up being below one. It's 5%. So that thing is scarce. But if we have something like Disney, a movie, every single superhero movie that Disney has made, we could stream every single one of those movies to the whole world's population probably 10 times over at near zero marginal costs. So the abundance factor, and that is, is above one, it's probably above 10, it's very, very large. So A gives us a way to measure what 
the abundance of something is. And if it's below one, it lets us know it's a scarce item. I'm not a capitalist, I'm not a socialist, <laughs> but my socialist friends and my capitalist friends have debates, and I've heard my socialist friends make this argument against my capitalist friends, which is, quote, a rich person has an overabundance of money. Therefore, the dollar bills individually is less valuable to them, as the socialist is making this claim, quote, that taking a few million dollars away from a billionaire doesn't matter as much compared to somebody else, end quote. They're taking this idea that the more of something that you have somehow reflects the devaluation of the rest of what you have. And this conflation of value and scarcity is throughout all economics, including capitalism. Another clear example of this is piracy. A digital good, as I was talking about, could be distributed way more than imaginable. So these corporations, these companies, have to step in to the government and lobby the government and add regulation, add regulation to our citizens' lives to create artificial scarcity for digital goods, such that the company is attempting to measure these post-scarce digital goods in a way that fits with the existing scarcity models. So as you can understand, m back 300 years ago, when both capitalism was made and uh, 170-ish years ago, when communism was suggested, nobody was thinking about post-scarcity, but they're a very important issue to address in any economic model. So how do we fix this? Well, uh, do we just print more money every single time somebody streams a movie, so that way we somehow capture that to represent it in the increase in GDP? Mm, no, because that causes a whole other set of problems. So problem number five. How do you control the money supply such that over time it does not cause economic destabilization or a crash? Inflation. If you keep on printing more money, you get inflation and it destabilizes the economy. Well, this is also an interesting little thing, which is, okay, all economic models are using kindergarten math, and I think that's fine. But in this kindergarten math, we are using what are called counting numbers. So dollar bills and coins are countable numbers. And in computer science, that is called an integer. And in mathematics, that's represented by the typeface Z. It's of key importance to note that any change, or I should say the value of a countable dollar is tied to the change in supply. So simple math example here is if you have 100 coins and I hold one of them, then my coin is worth one over 100. But if we add 100 more coins, we now have 200 coins and the value of that coin, previously 1 over 100, is now 1 over 200, which is far less. But this is absolutely ridiculous. I am holding the same physical coin. How on earth is it changing its value over time? I mean, we're all used to this because we've grown up in societies that use this type of economic model. But think of how ludicrous that is. I'm holding something. I'm not—it's right there. And just over time, it's changing. That's like, that's bizarre. That's like not natural. So— Math has this other really cool thing called real numbers that include ratios and fractions and all this other stuff, including countable numbers. So we can adjust economic models to use real numbers and do something interesting. So here's a little story, right? You got some Bitcoin and you really want pizza. You're not a hodler. Uh, you really want some pizza, so you're, you're waiting in line to get that pizza, but you're, you're thinking, oh man, what was the price, what was like the conversion rate of pizza today to like, uh, sorry, Bitcoin to, to dollar amount? Was it 10,000, was it 7,000? And then you're thinking, man, this line is really long, and they say that the pizza is worth, let's just pretend it's one Bitcoin to make the math easy in terms of tracking numbers. You're like, oh man, if this is gonna be a 10 minute line, I really hope that Bitcoin doesn't go up. Because then when I go and buy my pizza, I'm effectively paying more. But I do kind of hope that it goes down, because then I can get 
the pizza for cheaper. This is also true with dollar bills, with inflation stuff, because of the countable number. But if you were to represent the price of the pizza as a ratio, as a fraction, you could have the entire economy inflate by 80 times, crash in half, and do all sort of loops and circles, whatever, in the 10-minute time, and you'd be totally unaffected. So key piece right here, key piece is that ratios hold true regardless of supply. Ratios hold true regardless of supply. Great. So now we, we actually have some mathematical ways of fixing the inflation problem, but there's all sorts of other problems, and it actually makes some of these problems worse. Um, I do want to note, though, that you can really only have a ratio-based economic model in an internet-era world. So you couldn't, you couldn't do this even like 80 years ago. But hey, we have the internet now, so cool. Let's move forward. <sighs> Problem number four. How do you prevent the currency from being manipulated or civil attacked? Ratio-based systems uh, have this problem even worse than counting-based systems, but they all, they all have the exact same problem. So, what math do we need? This is called the handshake problem. And as a mathematician, I look at this extremely simple looking formula and I just drool because it's beautiful. N by N minus one over two. So what is the handshake problem? A handshake problem, you can think of it as, if you were to collect a contact card from every single person at this conference, so, such that you handshook every single person, you got a, a, a single contact card from them, how many handshakes would happen at the conference? Okay, why does that matter? Well, this is really neat because the problem is a permutation or a combinatoric problem. So the results have explosive differences, which means as long as you have a rough estimate of the actual population size, which is n, you're able to use this equation to get a probabilistic guarantee of how many other accounts in the system are fake. This isn't just theory, though. It's actually working in practice. So my colleague, Marty Malmi, was the very first contributor to Satoshi on Bitcoin. Like, old school days, 2010, 2011, he was known by as Sirius. And he's come up with an algorithm called Identify that does something similar. He ran this algorithm against the Bitcoin trading network and was able to detect the bots in the trading network. And it uses this really cool principle called the six degrees of separation in psychology. It's very well known in psychology. And this was from a long time ago. The six degrees of separation states how many times would we have to physically mail something, handshakes apart, before we could connect with everybody in the world? Only six times, on average, through physical mail forwarding. But on modern social networks, Twitter, Facebook, that degree of separation is down to three and a half handshakes. Three and a half degrees of separation. Think about that. If I, if I handshake across three people depth, I can connect with anybody in the world. So Marty has gone on to create something called Iris, which is a better, moneyless alternative to Bitcoin. A moneyless, decentralized alternative. It's not just the very first believer in Satoshi that is building these types of systems. You also have extraordinary centralized competition. Your credit card company, Facebook, China, they're all taking these types of algorithms and using it to do fraud detection, laundering prediction, and automatic auditing. 
So the key takeaway for this point is the future of where money has already gone and is gone. This is where the future of money has already gone and money itself is gone. I can't believe I just said that to a crowd full of Bitcoin people. <laughs> um, there's still a lot of problems, which is uh, the climax, actually, of all of the economic uh, questions. It's, it's, it's the one thing that all in any economic system has to answer. It has to answer, well, how do you set prices such that you value hard work and labor? I don't know. I mean, well, how does socialism and capitalism do this? It's, it's actually, I mean, you probably intuitively already know this, but it's interesting how they answer it. Capitalism says that there is this dollar amount, which is the average across the force of the free market. That's what capitalism is saying. Hey, you know, that's how you set prices to measure labor or hard work. Socialism says, actually, we should set prices based off of class. So if you're poor, something's cheaper. If you're rich, it's more expensive. So we talked about what my socialist friends say to my capitalist friends, and well, what do my capitalist friends tell my socialist friends? Again, I'm not a socialist, I'm not a capitalist. My capitalist friends make the following argument, quote, if you do not reward people for working harder than others, then even healthy, capable people will not contribute to the economy and everybody will be worse off in an economic stalemate." End quote. Ladies and gentlemen, it's far worse than that. <laughs> There's a whole other set of uh, problems here, which is, I'll give you a little story. I met up with a uh, friend, he happened to be of the same socioeconomic class. Uh, I, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but we were in the same class. And we went to buy some coffee, and we paid the average market force of coffee, which is about $2 per cup. And we're sitting there chatting, and I'm starting to get sleepy. I enjoy the coffee, but coffee's making me sleepy. And my friend is just talking more and more and more, getting excited. And that's odd. If you know me, I'm usually the one chatting all the time. Um, and I suddenly wake up and realize, like, whoa, like, wait a second. We both enjoy coffee, but we get different value out of this thing. It doesn't matter whether we're richer or poor or there's an average market force. Coffee has a negative affect on me, and it's having a positive affect on you. It is a fuel source for you. We get different value out of the same thing. And what on earth every single economic model is supposed to figure out what we value? But we don't even bother asking people what they value. We use some sort of esoteric heuristic of purchasing power or class or something to try and infer or assume or get at that variable. That's absurd. Think about it. So my radical, revolutionary proposition to you is that if we want to get our data science right, why don't we just ask people what they value? Oh, but that can't be because everybody will answer differently. Well, that, well maybe that's the way economics is. So I'll, I'll disclose, uh, no offense to coffee connoisseurs in the, office, uh, in the event, um, coffee is less than 1% of my daily value. So what about things like housing? Well, housing is about 35% of my daily value. And again, this might be different for each of you. That's fine. Groceries or food is about 8% of my daily value. A car or transportation is about 15% of my daily value. It's not that hard. It's different, and people are scared of difference, but economics is supposed to answer this one crucial question, and we're just assuming 
everything else. <sighs> There's a lot more problems. Who do you reward, and how do you prevent free riders? Again, capitalism and socialism have different answers to this. The theory in capitalism is that as long as I have a larger amount of dollars than the good, then I can buy that good. And the theory continues that then the seller of the good is collecting these dollars, and their wealth is increasing, which gives them access to luxury goods. That works in a scarcity model. The scarcity model is basically stating the more luxurious or scarce an item is, the higher the price is. But if we want to account for digital goods, we actually have to, oddly enough, inverse this. Is that scarce goods have a smaller ratio. And, ha ha ha, sneaky. The A right here is the A from problem number six, the measuring post-scarcity. This is the abundance factor. And so it actually turns out that if the abundance factor is larger than the giving index, which I'll get to in just a second, the good is given away for free to that person in exchange for a statement of how valuable the interaction with the giver was. This is odd. As long as the abundance factor of something is larger than your giving index, you get things for free, as long as you state the value of the interaction. Well, of course, you need to know what the giving index is, but let's imagine um, that there is this Lamborghini, there's five of them, and there's a population of 100. So we can calculate the abundance factor, which in this case it's not because it's below one, of a Lamborghini is like 5%, 0.05. Um, in contrast to digital goods like a movie that has above one, you could stream it an infinite number of times, or let's take food, there might be um, 50, it, there might be um, 200 meals out there, but if there's only 100 people in this room, then the supply of 200 meals with the demand or population of 100, 200 over on 100 means as an abundance factor of two. So the giving index. Who do we reward? Who do we reward? Who do we reward? Okay. We give away things for free. We've got to calculate this, this giving index of who is the biggest giver in society. That's the type of society that I want to create. I want to, I want to create a society where, where, the re, where people are incentivized to go out and donate and give and help people. And I, that's my personal bias, right? But then how do you measure that? Especially if, the, if you have this ratio system, which is fuzzy all over the place. You really need a countable number system, an integer system, in order to determine who's the richest man in the world, uh, Jeff Bezos, right, with like 150 billion before he split it in half. You need this countable number, but we don't have that in a ratio system. So, oh no, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do, wait, wait. Ah, there, there, there's, there's a nice math trick, which is the population is limited. There's a finite number of people. So all we have to do is take the ratio the percent value, and multiply it against the number of people somebody has helped. So, to keep the math simple, it's a bit crude, imagine that there's 100 people in a population, and there's only two people who actually do the work of giving things, um, of producing and distributing goods to people. That's Alice and Bob. 98 are lazy people that are just free riders. So Alice builds a hotel that has 100 rooms in it, and every day, gives a room to every hundred person. And let's just average that each person winds up saying, on average, um, the, the value of having housing is 50% of their daily value. Of course, it's actually different for each person, but to make the numbers easy, 50%. Now there's Bob who gives food to a hundred people every single day, and people on average rate the food as being 10% um, of their daily value value. So to get 
this number, we have to be careful because we have to do two things. We multiply by the number of people that you've helped with the ratio, but we have to do it multiple handshakes deep. So here's how it plays out. Um, Alice helped 100 people. They all stayed at 50%, so 100 times 50% is 50. Bob helped 100 people. They stayed, it was 10%, so you get 10. However, Alice and Bob also helped each other. Bob would not be able to donate food to people if he had to pay for housing. But Alice is giving away housing for free, so Bob is stating that he gets 50% of his value from Alice. So we go one handshake below, and we add this extra compute to Alice's number, which is 50% of Bob's countable number of 10 is 5, and we add that to Alice's existing 50. So we get 55 as her total countable number for the uh, la uh, layer one, uh, two handshakes deep. Again, I want to be very clear. We do not take anything away from Bob. We're only adding. And vice versa. So Bob um, is giving value to Alice. Alice really wouldn't be able to do what she's doing unless she was getting food from Bob. So Alice has stated that Bob brings her about 10% of her daily value. So we take her first handshake level of the number, the countable multiplication, which was 50, and we take 10% of that, and we get 5. And now we add the 5. We don't take it away from Alice. We add an additional 5 to Bob's number, which was originally 10. Now um, handshake 2, we get 15. Now we get to just run a simple sorting um, equation in programming for familiar. So we, we take the number of 55 for Alice, the number of, 50, uh, of 15 for Bob, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 for all the 98 other people who are just benefiting from this. And you're able to sort that and get a percentile of who's the top giver in the economy. So top 2% giver, you know, mid 50, bottom 90%. So I'm going to bounce back to here, which is A over G. Alice is in the top 1%, right? Bob's top 2%, just rough calculations on the math, because uh, we intentionally constructed a situation that's easy for us to reason about. And you'll note here that the Lamborghini's scarcity index from the, uh, from the abundance calculation is 5%. Alice is in the top 1%. 1% is a smaller number. It's a smaller, give, the, the giving index is smaller than the scarcity index for um, the Lamborghini. So Alice actually gets the Lamborghini for free also because this equation holds true. Now, there's five Lamborghinis. Um, Bob might get the other one, but what about the remaining three? This is where the capitalism and the socialism kind of splits right down the middle, which is maybe Alice and Bob get to own the Lamborghini because they have a smaller number, but there's three Lamborghinis left over, and that can be crowd shared across the rest of the members in the society. So we're still utilizing the resources in an economy, um, but when the index doesn't match, it has to wind up splitting, uh, and that winds up being the crowd-sharing economy. Another way to think about this, so, so stop thinking about that um, and switch over to this idea. You're at a bakery, and there's 10 people in line. You would hope, just from a social standpoint, if Alice walked in, that the 10 people in the line who are getting free housing from Alice would be like, thank you, Alice, so much. Please, like, please move ahead of me in line. You've given me so much value. I want to give you priority access. So regardless of whether the society actually does this socially, we're actually able to algorithmically give priority access to the biggest givers, the biggest donors in a society to the top of the line that matches their giving index. So there is a strong incentive of getting luxury and reward and priority access that still drives this economy forward as some of the best parts that we've seen in capitalism. But in capitalism, you want to prevent free riders. And that then causes um, a rift in values between people that is oftentimes irreconcilable, is miscommunicated, because then what do you do with the free riders? Well, this economy actually says we don't, that we're not going to try and prevent free riders. We just want to have the best, biggest givers. And as long as there's post-scarce goods, 
free riders get those things. And that naturally actually drives entrepreneurs to look at what are currently scarce goods and how can they automate manufacturing in order to give it to more people. We still got problems. We still got problems. The last problem. Great, Mark. This sounds utopic. <laughs> Who's going to switch? I mean, really? Is anybody going to use this? Is anybody going to do I mean, why? We exist in reality, right? This is not practical. So how do you solve for any economic system the problem of adoption? You use the previous economic system. Right now we got capitalism, and capitalism is this really cool function of competition that drives profit down to zero. In hopes that for a lot of these companies like Uber, which is subsidizing the price from investors, or Amazon, which is subsidizing the price for future customer attention, they do it on the hopes of eventually killing off their competitors so that they can then jack the prices up as a monopoly. Um, so it's weird because if like it, it, the, the competitive nature of capitalism leads to benefit for consumers, which is zero profit margins on the companies, um, such that it's a better deal for the, the consumers. But if that company is too successful in their job, they become a monopoly. And now prices get jacked up, you get totalitarianism, you get all the things that we are afraid of that governments themselves do. So let me tell you a little bit of a story, okay? Right? Like, Okay, we, we actually, we have, we have an economic force in capitalism that's already driving things towards free. Alice and Bob are two ice cream stores across the street from each other. Bob has the superior product. Alice is clever and ruthless. She's an industrialist. She knows how, how to go out in the world and conquer. So, she realizes, ha ha, I'll just slash my prices in half. What's Bob going to do? So she slashes her prices in half, and, and even though Bob's got the superior product, uh, people on a price point alone wind up driving more customers towards Alice, and Bob has to retaliate. He's like, oh, no. Um, so Bob lowers his prices as well. So now Alice is screwed. She's at her end game. No. Alice is even more clever. She's like, huh. If I give free ice cream to my patrons in exchange for them rating me on Google Maps and Yelp, <laughs> then people will see that I'm a superior product because they're gonna see my higher ratings on Yelp while Bob's not listed. This is already happening today, like historically. I, I've gotten so many free goods at restaurants to rate them on Yelp. And Google Maps and Yelp hate this because they act as a central bank and they're trying to control the legitimacy of their currency. But the issue is the economics are inevitable. It is a win for me as a customer. It's a win for Alice as a store. So good luck, central banks of reputation. I strongly, I, I do not condone reputation systems. They very easily lead to dystopic systems. But it's, it's easy for us to think about this and the evolutionary forces of um, adoption. So Bob sees the strategy that Alice is doing and of course adopts it. It gives a free ice cream away in order to get um, ratings. But something fascinating has happened at this point. Every single store owner, every business, is now accepting this kind of implicit reputation currency. Imagine if Bitcoin was accepted everywhere, right? Like, like the power of a currency is in its distribution and its network effect. And Bitcoin got that so right with the deflationary mechanics that it drove adoption. Brilliant, like brilliant, brilliant. But once everybody in the economy is already using reputation systems, which, hey, we are Google Maps, Yelp, whatever, that new type of currency, which I do not, I do not condone, already has widespread adoption. So Alice, with her ruthless ideology, realizes, ha-ha, I can get free milk 
from the grocery store. I can get free eggs from the grocery store if I rate them highly. So Alice decides to bet everything in. All the stores she goes to anyways already accepts reputation, so she says, I don't accept dollar or fiat or any scarce currency. That also includes, unfortunately, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is fundamentally the same type of currency, and that's why governments try to ban it, but they don't ban reputation systems, is because Bitcoin is viewed as being the same type of currency, and it's crushing it, right? It's like totally beating out these governments. Um, but governments don't react to other types of currencies. So you're able to use the previous economic system as a driving force to get adoption for the new economic systems. So what's going on here? We spent a year doing research into what are these problems in economics, um, how can we model things, what are the math behind them, and we way over our heads. <laughs> um, this is a new branch of economics. This is a new branch of science. And the reason why I say this is because capitalism is defined as the production of goods as controlled by private owners. Socialism is defined as the distribution of goods as controlled by the public state. Freeism is defined as the production and distribution of goods incentivized through algorithms. That should terrify you. Whose algorithms? Who's writing the algorithm? I absolutely admit that even in the work that we're doing on this branch of freeism, we have found this new continent and we're giving it a name. We haven't explored all of the routes in it. We've thought very deeply about it, but I my intuition is that if freeism, as I've defined it, were to be implemented by Facebook, we would get a really bad dystopic system. But if it was also implemented by a government, say China, we'd also get a very scary or dystopic system. What that means is that the, the only middle ground for freeism of all the possible branches we could explore inside of it that might actually result in a society that we want that is about human flourishing and then the embetterment of humanity is through a completely voluntary and decentralized approach. And we have the mechanisms to drive that adoption that straddles both sides of the political divide and takes the values from both camps that are arguing so viciously against each other in this zero-sum political game that has got scarcity as its game mechanic. And we're saying, no, what if we go to a win-win system? We can get people to opt out of money, not only for fun, getting free stuff, but also for profit, getting freedom. So our team, Marty Malmi, one of the very first contributors to Satoshi, Dr. Amber Cazell, a visiting scholar at Stanford, doing psychology, me running the decentralized protocol with millions of users. As we look forward into the future, we're trying to take these equations that I've showed you today and in probably about two years from now, once we're at 1% of the world's population, start experimenting with these economic simulations we've already done, that we're already doing modeling on, and putting it in practice with hundreds of millions, if not billions of people. So I would like to warmly ask you that I want a handshake with you. You have connections, I have connections. If we can team up and opt out, perhaps we can create a society that is more free, as in freedom for people, but also more free as in universal health care without all the bad stigma associated with. So to end on this note, my response 
to Karl Marx and Adam Smith, the treatise of free economics, free.eco. I'm tweeting about this a lot on Twitter, so please jump in and ask me really challenging questions because we need that. But at the very beginning, as I stated, if money is a tool to get the lifestyle that we want, then economics is a tool that can get us the society that we want. So look at each other, shake hands, find what is beautiful, and cultivate that in all of us. Thank you. Okay, Mark, thank you for your talk. I very believe it was inspirational for some of you. And the audience, now it's your turn. So, any question? Mark, thanks a lot for this talk and for presenting your thoughts so clear and straight. Um, I have one question which is related to marginal production costs. Because um, obviously also streaming the YouTube video has some electricity bill that has to be paid. And as long as you apply this to, this to a non-scarcity um, world, it would like make um, directly uh, or would be directly applicable. But um, as long as you have marginal costs, um, I'm just interested in how you think about that and how you apply that to your model currently. Absolutely. Super, super important question. And I'm going to answer with capitalism, right? Which is there's an economic incentive for whatever, for, for Arizona to offer Elon Musk with the Tesla plant subsidized deals to build the, the power plant in Arizona. I think, it's, I think it's in Arizona. So we're already seeing this idea that you kind of wine and dine powerful people and give them cheaper rates in order to kind of inherit that reputation. Um, same thing, like it, it, if you get a deal with Amazon Web Services where you're supplying the electricity for Amazon Web Services, you know it's in high demand. So it is advantageous for you to offer perhaps a discounted rate. The sweet thing about this post-economic model oh, with some of the equations I, oh, I'm not gonna skip back, is it actually formalizes this, right? It, it was the example of Alice helping Bob and Bob helping Alice. Bob has an incentive to give Alice um, free food even if Alice gives Bob a much, 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 much lower daily percent value because Alice is helping so many people that even a smaller percent value then at the second handshake deep represents a much larger increase in Bob's value. Does that answer? Um, pa partially, I'll come to you later about cool. that. Just keep in mind that in an experimental phase on the boundaries of your network, this will be a very critical point you have to consider. You got me there, yeah, like, you know, because I, I, I did greater than, I didn't do greater than equal, so at the point of one, Ooh, you, okay, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, anybody else? So, no questions from the audience now. Okay, we did it. <laughs> um, so, uh, thanks again for the talk. You, you mentioned um, a bunch of times about how people should tell you how they value things by giving them a percent value. Um, can you sort of explain how that's calculated? Um, one of the things we look about, we think about in, in economics is that when people tell you how much they value, that is a cheap signal, right? I can tell you um, that your uh, bar of gold is worthless. It's value of zero percent of my value. Um, but if I actually have to make an expensive signal of trading something that I value highly for it, then I can actually discover the price. Um, so I'm really like, it seems that's sort of glossed over here. And like, um, so how do, you, how do you solve that problem? It's glossed over because we ran like 10 different approaches and this one seemed to be the best fit. But I absolutely want to continue the conversation because there are so many different ways that you can measure value um, that any, like any tiny factor in any of this system, just slightly off, could throw the whole economics out of whack. So this was kind of our best guess with the, the approaches we tried, but um, it could go wrong. More than happy to continue um, the reason why that was our best guess, and it basically boils down to when I'm handing over Bitcoin and I get to decide the price of Bitcoin, 
I'm going to cheat the system because Bitcoin's a scarce good. But if daily percent values aren't really the scarce thing, you might initially, at the beginning of the network, at the boundary, have people who feel like they want to cheat the system. But over time, they're fundamentally not losing anything. And so our, our intuition, compared to other systems that had worse results, is that people would stop cheating and become more honest. Or if everybody is dishonest, then the average is out in the calculations anyways. And then like another, another piece um, is that there's also still the right of refusal in this system. I mean, maybe that gets banned, but like in my head, there's still the right of refusal. So if somebody's coming back and, and wants my free groceries and keeps on rating me at 0%, 0%, 0%, I kind of be like, mm, okay, maybe I'm going to start discriminating against you. Um, that doesn't sound nice or good, but then there's a flip side, which is if people, if there's collusion on the produce, on the distributors, they can potentially say, I'm not going to give you this good unless you give me a really high value. So there, yeah, really good question. If you, if you have explored this and have answers, please talk to us. This is all new stuff. I'm presenting my best intuitions and the simulations we've done, but I'm not an authority. Nobody's authority on Fordism yet. So please challenge me. I, we need to find holes before we implement it in two years from now. Okay, this is the last one. What do you do about human evil? I'm talking about people who don't care about your rational options, your pretty, pretty landscapes. They want something way beyond anything normal or humane or anything. They, want, they don't want just your belief. They want your immortal soul. And they will kill to get it. And nothing, absolutely nothing you say or present or offer will deter them. These are psychopathic, um, murdering fiends. And these people exist in the world. Yeah. So what do you do about them? So there's two ways to answer that. Um, I'm going to skip to the second one. The first one has to do with uh, more libertarian values. But I think what you're actually asking is a history question more than an economic question. That assuming, yeah. So I'm going to answer it with history. You see the balkanization of the world as technology increases, and you see world wars play out in their own microcosms. So with Western civilization, you get World War I, World War II, um, fighting against each other, and it's terrible. Um, they, they have a fundamentally driven ideology that doesn't care about the economics underneath, no matter how good the economics are. You're seeing the same thing play out in the Middle East that effectively the Middle East is playing out its own World War I, World War II, inheriting a lot of the technology um, from World War I, World War II of the different governments that are sponsoring those faction groups. So a key thing to understand is that that's disgusting, all of it, um, and sad, but a lot of the children in these conflicts are getting seduced by capitalism. They're getting seduced by Starbucks being on every corner. Um, most children revolt, maybe, maybe you call that an evil itself, most children revolt against their parents, and they wonder, why on earth are they out dying on this bloody battlefield when I could be sipping tea? So there's a very seductive process for each one of these economic pro um, routes that I think the children want to sacrifice less. So that is not an economic model, that's just a, a change in morality. And I think history has shown us that even the greatest evil can be trumped by a child that has either better ambition or can be seduced by a more tantalizing future. That is not happening in England or France where uh, Muslim children are becoming more radicalized than their you know, fairly relatively relaxed parents. Socialism and capitalism is a scarce game, so it No, I'm not profits, talking about socialism and well, capitalism. But, but it profits on radicalization, You've, because yeah. in order to gain money from somebody else, I have to make them make a decision, but and I'm, that drives I'm not talking about socialism and decisions. capitalism. I'm talking about human beings and Satanists. Like, these are bloodthirsty maniacs. It's like, it's, it, so far the models that you've presented don't contain what I'm talking about. That is true. 
Um, neither did capitalism or socialism. So my hope is that maybe we can experiment with freeism in France and see how it impacts the moral decisions of people. And honestly, I do wish people were less violent, but I'm also a volunteerist, so I don't want to, I don't want to use violence to force people to be less violent. So um, I feel like that is the point at which I become evil, and I'd rather avoid that. But good point. Okay, uh, so Mark, thank you for your presentation and f for your thoughts that you were, you were sharing with us. And also thank you for your questions. I would like to just point out that Mark asked you f to challenge him. So definitely Congress is not ending. So continue find him anywhere around the place. I think that that's the, that's the way how it should be done. And Mark, thank you. Thank you. Okay, just just to remind you, we have a break now here on the stage, so Slavarna, but.